Election results announcements are characterized by large jubilation across the nation, but the streets have been silent, and that silence has been very loud. Whatever side of the divide you belong to, one thing is common. We all want a safe, stable, and prosperous nation. How can we all come together to achieve that? On the other hand, do we trust the rule of law to deliver justice, if need be? However, we cannot move to the future without revisiting our past. What lessons have we learned? What are the takeaways from the 2023 presidential elections? To discuss this, um, joining us from Abuja, I have Fakiria Hashim. She is a researcher. Hello, Fakiria. Hello, good well, afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the program. Also joining us in the studio in Lagos is Ibitayo Reju. He is a legal practitioner. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here. Also joining us via Skype is Chidi Okereke, who is a digital strategist. Hello, Chidi. It's good to see you. Hi, you. All right, so I'm going to start with Ibitayo. Let's get straight into it. Um, it's been a week, and so much is happening. Uh, Absolutely. How would you rate the performance of the Independence National Electoral Commission in this election? Well, you see, first and foremost, as you said, I'm a legal practitioner, and I, I can only make conclusions based on facts available to me. Um, there have been a couple of controversies that have arisen from the conduct of the election and the process. Um, and like I said, look, I voted in a single polling unit, and there are over 176,000 other polling units where these elections were conducted. So it's impossible for anyone, as a matter of law, to roll out a scorecard, you know, and provide an accurate measurement as to, you know, INEX performance. As far as I'm concerned, from a personal point of view, from where I voted, the process seemed to be seamless, um, free, uh, and fair, and devoid of the usual election irregularities. But that is not to say that I have not been privy to um, a couple of um, information on social media where um, certain electorates were disenfranchised, either due to violence, um, misconduct, alleged misconduct, as the case may be, from some of the electoral officers. So in a nutshell, I, I think it's a mixed bag. Um, and like I said, it's a question of evidence, you know, in ruling out a scorecard for INEC, as far as I'm concerned. OK, thank you very much. Fakiria, uh, you are a researcher. You deal with numbers. And um, one of the major points that a lot of people have been bringing up in this election is the fact that the Independence National Electoral Commission did not upload the results um, as at when due, you know, to the portal as the Electoral Act had demanded. Um, what are the numbers looking at, uh, looking like rather, and did we have a free and fair election from a data point of view? Hi, um, thank you for that question. Um, so up until yesterday, we were still hearing that INEC had not completely uploaded uh, most results from the IREV uh, to on the IREV. Um, and, you know, g given that, I, I think that was really poorly uh, implemented, right? Um, I mean, from the from the data side of things, um, I, I believe CDD um, noted that we've seen about 30% of INEC officials arriving at polling units not on time. We've seen over 30% of INEC officials arriving on time, and you know the rest being disrupted by elect electoral violence. Um, I mean, uh, fundamentally, I, I, INEC has performed underwhelmingly um, this time around, but it doesn't really contrast with um, previous elections that we've had. We've, all of the issues that we've witnessed have been consistent with INEC's performance over the past few years. 
Um, so, you know, I think there was, there's been a lot of expectation um, based on the budget allocation, that was the allocation of resources that was given to INEC that they would uh, perform a lot better this time, um, but that had not been the case. Um, there's been a lot of irregularities, um, and we've, you know, we've, we've witnessed a lot of disruptions. So yeah, um, I, I don't, I don't think INEC did um, did perform as we had hoped. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chidi, social media was totally underestimated. The impact of social media on this election uh, was underestimated prior to the elections. I mean, we even had a presidential candidate, Kwan Kwaso, uh, who said that most of his voters are not on social media. And a lot of the political heavyweights um, really concentrated on the grassroots, quote and unquote, um, as they would refer, uh, which means people, which they think means people that are not on social media. What was the impact on social media of social media on this election? Um, yeah, I like the fact that you referenced the fact that a lot of people underestimated the possible impact of social media because at the beginning of the campaign, especially of the the campaign by the Labour Party candidates, there were there were conversations around how social media did not have an impact, how it was four people tweeting from a room. From that, it grew to a movement that basically um, officially won more than six million votes at. Um, well, at the end of the day, when the courts, you know, investigate and everything, we'll find out that more votes are won. So yes, social media is a very, very valuable tool. Now, as internet connectivity deepens in Nigeria, it is only, it is only, um, it only makes sense that more people are definitely going to be connected. So when they say they are campaigning to grassroots, they are not campaigning to people on social media. Who do you think are the people who are at the grassroots level? My mother has WhatsApp. Ten years ago, that was not the case that people in the village can connect to us in, in um, urban areas. So who do you think people are listening to? Where do you think they get their information from? So if anybody thinks social media is not important, I think this, this election is a, is a testament to the fact that social media is, is a block on its own. So there has been a lot of discrepancies. Um, a lot of people took pictures and made videos of their polling units. In fact, there's a particular viral video of um, uh, a polling unit counting LP votes, and it has since gone viral. LP 26, LP 75, or whatever the video was saying, right? Um, now, do you think that those pictorial, those pictures, videos, would be used as sort of evidence to challenge the results by INEC in the courts. Do you think it's credible evidence? Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, um, so I can't exactly um, speak to the credibility of that in the court of law. But I think social media basically did what the INEC um, IREF was supposed to do, right? If we do not have all those evidence, if we do not have all those proof, this result would have stood. So I think it, it, while a lawyer is in a better position to say whether it's admissible in court or not, I think it should be admissible because this is the people's mandate. This is actually what people took at the polling units, and this is what a lot of them used as as um, their 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 confirmation that this election was won by a particular party. So for it not to be admissible, it would be very very weird in my opinion. Okay, just to throw something in, you know, you made a statement that this result would have stood. I just also want to let you know that the result is standing until otherwise proven by the Supreme Court, which, of course, would handle the final matter. Um, I'm going to throw the same question to you. You are the legal practitioner here. Do you think some of those pictures and videos on social media are authentic enough to stand as evidence? Well, unfortunately... I can't make a comment as to whether or not the court will admit a document. You know, for a document to be admitted in court, it must satisfy the evidentiary requirements for its admissibility. However, the, I mean, case law is clear in satisfying or essentially in discharging the burden of proof as regards voting. It is the result sheet obtained from the polling unit that is admissible in evidence. However, like you rightly said, the score, the result that was announced by INEC remains the result as of today. It will then take a petitioner 
to file a petition, of course, within 21 days, and then adduce facts, you know, that will be surrounded by the three um, conditions or the three requirements for presenting a petition under Section 134 of the Electoral Act. The first is that the person who won that election was not qualified to contest the election at the time of the election. The second one is that the person who was returned as, as the winner did not score the majority of the lawful votes that were cast at the election. And the third requirement is the fact that there was non-compliance with the provisions of the Electoral Act. So notwithstanding the document the petitioners intend to rely on, they must bring their petition under these provisions of the Electoral Act. And I would want to give an academic answer because, like I said earlier, the petitioner has 21 days to present his petition. And I would only advise that we'll wait and see the petition, or petitions, as the case may be, presented by the petitioners. And then, of course, I'll wait the decision of the court on the All right. issue. All right. Um, I'm going to ask a follow-up question to that, but um, let me speak to Fakiria. Um, I think this has been the most dynamic election since 1999. Um, for the first time, we've seen a candidate not winning up to 50%, you know. Um, Bola Tinubu won 12 states, Atiku won 12 states, while Obi won um, 11 states and the FCT. And what that presents to us is that we now have um, a precedent that a lot of people did not vote for. Uh, what does that mean for Nigeria? And how do you think um, the president-elect should navigate through this? Um. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think we're witnessing a very interesting um, change in the dynamics of, of elections, right? Uh, predominantly PDP states um, his, that have historically voted for PDP in the past uh, few years have not voted PDP. We've seen them turn to LP states. Um, APC, uh, Buhari voting blocks um, have been split between the, the two major parties. So um, I, I think watching all of this unravel, like on row, um, has been really, really interesting to see. And um, yeah, as, as you can see, like no one is out celebrating. I think that has been that has been the talk of the streets like for a few days now uh, on social media and also you know when you go out it's probably going to be the first elections where we're not seeing people out you know celebrating people creating you know a sense of you know um you know victory and then and, and like uh, tapping into their sense of like happiness and and, and victory and that, you know, I, I don't think that reflects really well on, on the, you know, on, on the process, right? Um, many people feel cheated, right? Um, as you can see, there's been a few protests here and there in a few states here in FCT. We, we had a protest a couple of uh, days ago. Um, and, you know, like, uh, Whatever the court decides, if the president-elect is here to stay, then he needs to be able to navigate that so that it becomes a government that everyone can relate to. But if if he isn't, then you know I I believe we'll see a lot more uh, celebrations that right. that come through. But you know that's that's besides the point. Um, the current you know the the current president-elect should be able to create an environment where people feel a sense of inclusivity in, in government. Because as it stands, you know, a, a lot of people that do not vote feel that they are going to be alienated from, from, from government, from, from the process. So it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of weeks where evidence the opposition parties are able to collate and submit to INEC, uh, sorry, submit to the courts, and whether or not that is going to make a difference. I think a lot of people are hopeful, um, but 
you know, it, it remains to be seen if anything will change. Um, but, you know, to the pr president, like that, I think we need to, there needs to be a sense that, you know, this is not a government for a specific group of people and that there is room for everyone uh, to be part of, you know, governance. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for Korea. Um, you did mention that um, the streets have been silenced because usually there's widespread celebration across the streets and also um, on social media. Um, Chidi, um, there has been so much aftermath, you know, from the elections, and I think it has sort of overpoured into the forthcoming elections. Um, we're currently seeing what looks like almost a tribal war and a lot of incitations here and there on social media. How much do you think this is affecting our democratic process, and how do you think we can combat fake news in some instances? Uh, it's, I mean, it's really, really sad that um, tribalism has, you know, become a, a, a thing in, I mean, it's, it's always been a thing, but it's, it's like it's becoming worse. Maybe it's because of the prevalence of social media, more people are becoming like their parents. Um, we're, we're, we're beginning to spread these things faster than it used to be spread before, but it's really, really sad that in 2023, people are still doing things and talking about talking, um, tribal sentiment. It's, it's very, very unfortunate. I think... I think people who know better should do better in trying not to proliferate this, try not to spread it as much as possible. I, I do not listen to dog whistle. I do not amplify it. I never, ever pay attention to it. And I think if we do as much as, as we can to shut it down, it would go a very, very long way. Very, 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 very long way. Um, the upcoming elections are still, um, are still um, an opportunity for people to vote who they want to vote for. Don't listen to anybody telling you that you should not vote for somebody because the person is a different tribe or whatever. Vote your conscience and vote your choice. And when you vote your choice, stand by your choice. I'm not a fan of people being insulted or or, or abused because they choose whoever they choose. Whoever it is you choose, as far as the process is free, fair, devoid of intimidation, nobody is disenfranchised. I'm fine with whatever the result is. So everybody should vote. Keep tribal and religious sentiment in your pocket, please. There's no time for that. 100%, I agree with you. Um, now, we've seen a lot of states, uh, a lot of slots in the, the Senate and, of course, the, the National Assembly elections. Uh, LP, the Labour Party is taking a lot of seats, grabbing a lot of seats. In fact, of particular mention, what happened at Etiosa, um, the candidates... Uh, of the Labour Party, Thaddeus Atta, who of course did his due diligence with the campaign, but obviously because of Banky W's popularity, a lot of people might not have sort of, you know, known him personally or his antecedents or what he stands for. Uh, but the fact that the P2B effect, they wanted to vote LP from top to bottom, do you think that might play a critical role um, in the first coming election? And, how important is it for people to single out the candidates as opposed to just voting for your party because of the presidential, um, the candidate that you're supporting is from their party? Um, so there are so many ways to look at this. There are so many lenses, and I don't even think I have enough time to dissect this thing. But the summary for it for me is this: I did, I, to be honest, I voted Banky W because I know him. To be honest, again, I did not know the Labour Party candidates before the election day. But at my polling unit there, there was kind of like, a, compared to the presidential and the um, the presidential elections, the disparity between the LP and the other parties, there was kind of like a, almost a balance. LP still won in my polling unit, but there was kind of like a balance because more people knew Banky W. Now, voting top to bottom is a thing. If you go anywhere in the world, there are regions that vote a particular party because that is how they are built. It is very, very important that a president has his people in the National Assembly. So if people have voted top to bottom because they have that in mind, that is very, very important. But I personally will always say that people should vote for people, not parties. I will personally always say that. I understand people who think otherwise, but I'll always, always advocate for voting people over party. For example, my choices in this election are, are spread, like they are spread across parties in this governorship election. I'm not going to advertise anybody, but my choice in Abia State is different from my choice in Oyo State. It's different from my choice in River State. These are states I have affiliations with, and of course, legal states. So I encourage people to vote people they think 
can do and create an environment where everybody tries. And if that is what your choice is based on, fantastic for you. All right, thank you very much. Oh, uh, we're almost running out of time now. Quickly, very quickly, um, we are at a very critical stage. Just like my opening monologue said, um, Bola Metinigo was elected with 37%. None of the candidates have conceded. Yes. Um, it's very, very important that irrespective of what our political views are, whatever happens in the next couple of months, um, it should be in the interest of Nigeria. How do we move forward from this very fragile state that we are in currently? Well, I think, like, um, Bola Ahmed Tinubu in his accept acceptance speech um, has come out to encourage Nigerians to embrace democracy. Um, Peter, Mr. Peter Obia and Atiku Ababaka have also communicated their intention to challenge the results of the elections. In addition to that, they've also encouraged their supporters to remain calm and peaceful. And so generally the advice is, let us await the decisions that will be taken by these political parties. They've said they will challenge the results. If the case gets to court, let Nigerians await the decision of the courts. I, for, I for one, anticipate that the issues in this election would make it to the apex courts. And notwithstanding what happens at the Court of Appeal, I mean, for the presidential election, um, it will make it to the apex courts. And I believe because of some of the peculiarities of these elections, so for example, the BVAS technology, the IRF technology, these things are novel. And so I feel the Supreme Court will be presented with an opportunity to make a landmark decision, you know, on some of the issues surrounding, you know, and some of the controversies surrounding the elections. And so essentially, like the, all the candidates have said, they've encouraged our supporters to remain calm and just let the rule of law take its course. Yes, speaking about the Supreme Court having to make a decision, right? Yes. Uh, what exactly do you mean? Because basically we have not the elections just forthcoming Saturday. Um, we've seen that the Beavers did not, so in, many, in some cases you, you hear cases like, oh, it's not charged or this or that. There's been a lot of discrepancies. So when you say make a decision, are you saying to make sure that they enforce using the Beavers as the Electoral Act demands? So what exactly are you saying? So, so, so <laughs> the issues surrounding the use of Beavers and... I mean, so there are two major issues that I think are controversial. The very first issue is the issue as to whether or not a candidate who does not score 25% of the votes in the FCT, whether or not INEC ought to have returned that candidate as the winner of the election. As we all know, um, Ashwajubala Ahmed Tinumbu won 11 states, and I think he got to third majority. 12, in, actually. No, he won 12 states, sorry. Yes, 12 states, I beg your pardon. Yeah. And he got to third majority in over 25 states. However, he didn't get a quarter of the votes in the FCT. I think Alaj Abubakar Atiko as well did not get a quarter of the votes in the FCT. And so I know during the coalition and even after the announcements, um, I've read where supporters of the Liberal Party had said, look, section 134 of the Constitution, sub 1 and 2, says before a candidate can be declared as the winner of an election, a presidential election, he must score a two-third, 25% in two-thirds of the states in the Federation and the FCT. Now, there have been different schools of thoughts. A school of thoughts have said, look, in interpreting that provision of the Constitution, a candidate must score 25% in 24 out of the 36 states. In addition, that candidate must also score 25% in the FCT. That's the first school of thought. And the reasoning of that school of thought is premised on, you know, we have what we call canons of interpretation in law. When interpreting a statute, we have what we call canons. There's a literal rule which essentially says, if the provisions of a statute are clear and devoid of ambiguity, interpret that statute using its ordinary literal meaning. And so that's the canon of interpretation that first school of thought um, um, adopts. The other school of thought, the school of thought that said, look, in interpreting the provision of a statute, you must consider the intention of the draftsman. What was the intention of the person who drafted, who made that law? And they have argued that the intention of the draftsman was to create a situation where whoever is returned as the winner in the presidential election, 
you must have a wide spread of votes across all the states in the federal capital territory in, in Nigeria. And because the federal capital territory is not a state, there was no other way the Constitution could have described it. That school of thought, I've also said, look, in interpreting the provision of a statute, you can't do it in piecemeal. So whilst you're interpreting the provision of sections 134, you must do it concomitantly with the provision of sections 299. OK. That, OK, so to, to, to summarize it yes. in a layman's term, right? Yes, so, the first school of thought says that you must win 25% um, into third of the 36 states. And the FCT. And the FCT. Yes. That means 25% of the FCT. Yes. However, the second school of thought is you have to consider the FCT as some type of state Absolutely. in itself. So it means two-thirds of the 37, allow me to use the word states. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. Um, we just have to wrap up this segment. Thank you for coming on the show. Um, big thank you pleasure. to Fakaria from Abuja and, of course, Chidi joining us from Skype. Um, appreciate you guys. Thank you so very much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me.